Okay, well, good, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome along to this talk all about Cornish crustaceans. Uh, my name's Matt Slater, and I'm uh, the Marine Awareness Officer at Cornwall Wildlife Trust. And um, yeah, I'll be uh, introducing some of my favourite Cornish species of, um, of crustacean. Now, I have to point out there's an awful lot of species out there, and so this, and we've only got a relatively short period of time, so I won't be including every species of crustacean found in Cornish waters. It's really more of an introduction, and those of you who are, who are you know, passionate about this subject, I'm sure will, um, will want to go on and learn lots more, hopefully, at the end of the presentation. Um, so a, a bit about myself, I'm, I am a self-confessed crustacean, uh, crustacean geek. As you can see, uh, there's a few, a few holiday photos. I've, um, I've, I've been uh, catching crabs since I was a kid on every continent virtually. Uh, and um, there's, yeah, there's, there's just some examples. I've never been to America, North or South America, but um, yeah, some examples from Portugal, Australia. Um, and then a photo there, this is one of my career highlights, was uh, meeting uh, Terry Nutkins and Johnny Morris when I worked at the aquarium at Newquay. A, lot, a long time ago, that was back in the 90s. Um, and I've, had, I've been lucky having had a um, sort of a double faceted career. Now I work at the Wildlife Trust, but for many years I worked in the world of public aquaria. And I suppose um, crabs make very good aquarium exhibits, as do lobsters and other crustaceans. So that's kind of where, where I've been able to continue my, my passion and enthusiasm for this incredible family. So what are crustaceans? Well, they belong to a phylum called Arthropoda. Um, creatures with jointed limbs and um, believe it or not 80% of the uh, creatures on this planet are arthropods. Um, on land the arthropods, most of the arthropods you'll see are, are insects but in the sea uh, the dominant phylum are the crustaceans. So I'm just trying to get a, a different view up here in a minute. So, let's go back to the presentation. Bear with me, sorry, everybody. Okay, so believe it or not, there are 42,000 species of crustacean uh, known so far, many species still to be discovered, I'm sure. And their group includes crabs, shrimps, lobsters, woodlice sandhoppers, amphipods, prawns, and even barnacles. And um, now for this talk, I'm not gonna include every one of those groups. I'm afraid I've had to whittle it right down. So in this talk, we, we're not gonna look at shrimps and uh, we're just gonna focus on uh, crabs and lobsters and similar creatures. So um, what features do crustaceans have? Well, they all have a hard external skeleton and they have a segmented body each segment has modified appendages. So you've got around, around the head area, you have the antennae, the mouth parts, the gills, and then as you go down the body, you have the legs, etc. Now, the family that we're going to be talking the most about are decapods, and these have five pairs of major limbs. So that would be five pairs of, uh, four pairs of legs and, and two claws or chele. They have a hard carapace, usually covering the fused head and thorax, obvious eyes and tail. Now, um, this is a, a quick, this is taken out of an old textbook from university, but it shows you the way that crustaceans have evolved from a primitive shrimp-like ancestor, which is sort of long and thin. Eventually, we've ended up with the, the crabs, which are arguably the most advanced of all the crustaceans, having a uh, much reduced tail that's tucked underneath the body. It means that they can scuttle sideways much, much faster, and they've been able to adapt to a sort of semi-aquatic semi um, lifestyle emerging out into the into the shore. So this um, order decapods, decapod crustaceans, includes the brachyurans. These are the true crabs with five pairs of visible limbs. And I'm going to go through some local species now and some of these are going to be very familiar for you I'm sure. So you may well have come across these tiny little, this is a tiny little juvenile shore crab, it's only about a centimetre uh, in, in width. And these are very commonly found on the shore when you're lifting rocks, looking in amongst seaweeds, etc. When they're young, they're very uh, variable in colour. You often find really um, crazy patterns on them. We had one once brought into the aquarium that had a perfect 
um, white skull on its on its back. It's just just a freak occurrence. Um, but you often find black and white patterns. You find pinky patterns sometimes purple, a bit like coralline algae, really beautiful. And they lose these markings as they get older, sadly. And this is an adult common short pup caught while snorkeling. Underneath the crab, you can see the, the triangle shaped part there. This is the tail. Uh, this is the, the tail. As I said, it's much reduced. And on a male crab, the tail is narrow. And underneath, there are a couple of reproductive appendages. But underneath the female's tail, which is much wider, there are lots of sort of hairy legs, and that's where they keep their eggs, as you know. So that's how you can sex a crab by turning it upside down and looking at the shape of the tail. Uh, there's my son just demonstrating the safest way to handle a crab. This is quite an old photo now. But um, yeah, my kids certainly got introduced to crab handling at a young age. If you stop the crab from scuttling off, you just have to push your finger down onto its shell firmly to do that. Then you have plenty of time to think and to get your finger, your, your second finger and your thumb, just around the back of the crab. Never put your fingers underneath the crab. You see people doing that quite often on telly and it always ends up in them getting pinched. So the best way is under the edge of the shell to, to hold the, the carapace, to hold the crab like that safely. So the next species we're going to talk about, uh, edible crab, one that I often refer to as the pasty crab because of its sort of crimped edge all around the outside. Uh, edible crabs are very common around Cornwall and um, quite common on the shore actually but um, when you're diving we, we do see quite a lot of these and um, they can grow pretty big as my son has a scale um, I think this one was a good three kilo crab really large, large one brought into the aquarium uh, and sometimes we find very tiny ones as well so this is under a rock down at Helford only about a centimetre no less than a centimetre and again, they're very variable in colour when they're young, a bit like the shore crab is. Okay, so the next species, this is a very aggressive crab. Um, and when I was a kid, actually, it always used to upset me because some of the older boys were mean to these just because they look so fierce. They do behave aggressively if you disturb one of these. And um, this is the velvet swimming crab. Local name for them is devil crab, but, but I don't really like that name because it's not their fault they look fierce. Um, they are very, very fast and they can zip along sideways really quickly. They have modified back legs for swimming and a, a carapace covered in tiny hairs, which makes them feel sort of furry and velvety. Very sharp claws. And uh, this is the standard sort of pose. If you disturb one, they'll, they'll open their, their claws out. There's this distinctive red patches. Red in nature obviously means danger, as you know. Okay, the next species, uh, the Montague's crab. So as a boy growing up in Cornwall, I used to do an awful lot of rock crawling and we had a little um, fish tank in our house and we used to go down and collect specimens from our local beach. And this is one species that I don't remember seeing very often. But now if you go down to the same area, which is Swampool Beach in Falmouth, is my childhood beach, every single stain you lift for several of these Montague's crabs. Now um, they are I, I call them pebble crabs. That's kind of a, a name that I've been using for a while just because when you're talking to kids, they really get that. They feel like a pebble. They're very smooth. They've got these big, big claws and a smooth furrowed shell. Another name for it is the furrowed crab. You can see the little grooves there on the shell. They're extremely varied in colour. They can be browns, pur purple, reds, blues, um, but they're always, I, in my experience, quite a uniform colour. You don't get patterns on them. There's one just showing you his, his claws there. They're almost like bodybuilders, brilliant crabs. In some of the books it says they've got, um, it says that you should look for dark um, tips on the claws, but actually we in Cornwall we find that's not always the case for Montague's crabs. They, they don't always have dark claw tips. There's one with lighter claw tips and more of a reddish. Well, this is a really big one. I think that was a, a loo we found on the shore. So Montague's crab. Now in the same family as Montague's crab, um, we have another species called the Rizzo's crab. Um, and the Rizzo's crab can be told apart from the Montague's crab by two things. Firstly, the most obvious thing is it has very hairy back legs. And the second thing is its shell is quite flat on top, much less domed. Um, this photo here shows you the back legs much, much hairier. They're also more variable in colour and you get these patches sometimes on them. They can be beautiful marbly sort of patterns. There's another marbly one. Now both of these pebble crabs 
like I said, um, they used to be pretty scarce. I don't have any scientific proof of that, sadly, although it would be really interesting to go back through the records one day. But um, it, it seems to me that this species, both these species are now far more common than they used to be. Perhaps that is something to do with uh, climate change. Certainly this is one of the species that is mentioned as a climate change indicator. So the next species to show you, quite a, a small crab, mostly overlooked. And uh, this, this is the hairy crab often found in the whole fast of kelps. And there's my mate Dazza showing off one very nicely. This is, uh, they're really cool little crabs, very large claws. One claw larger than the other, they're right-handed crabs, these ones. And um, yeah, quite comical little fellows. Look out for them if you're on very low shore in amongst seaweeds and kelp hold fasts. Another species that lives in a sort of similar habitat, very rarely recorded, is the toothed crab. In this photo, you might just be able to make out a, um, a small little um, point at the top of the, uh, the, the face of the crab, if you like, on the top of the shell there. This is the point that gives it its name, the tooth crab. Only, this one's only a couple of centimetres maximum. Um, we found them several times on the shore, but whenever we find these, we get very excited um, because it is rarely recorded. Okay, uh, another species that you like to find on the shore in sandy areas, another small species, only about two or three inches, uh, two or three centimeters, sorry, is the circular crab. This is an expert at burying in the sand. It has swimming back legs, a bit like the velvet swimming crab, um, which it uses for whizzing around, but it also digs very rapidly. And as you can see, very well camouflaged. Another species that loves to dig in sand, and it's often found in our estuaries, in sort of more muddy sandy areas, is this one, the masked crab. And the amazing thing about the masked crab, you can see in this photograph, has very long straight antennae, which are, have interlocking hairs, which when, bur when burrowed, um, this antennae stands up and it provides almost a snorkel. It, it holds open a little, a little um, uh, tube, a tunnel in the sand, through which it can draw down seaweed, <laughs> sea, draw down sea water to, uh, to get the oxygen that it needs. Okay, so now we're moving a little bit deeper and some of the divers in the audience will be very, very familiar with this species, often found in the phalestry over mole beds and other areas. And this is a, another member of the swimming crab family, the harbour crab. Now harbour crabs, absolutely beautiful species, lovely corally sort of pinky colour. When you look at a, the back legs of a harbour crab, they have these distinctive bluey patches on their swim, swimming back legs. Uh, really stunning crabs. There's one um, holding on to its female. This is a male that's about to mate. Crabs have to wait until the uh, the female molts before they can they can reproduce. So for quite a long period of time, you'll find crabs. A male crab will actually sort of um, guard a female and uh, carry her around, um, you know, underneath him, waiting to mate with her. So another common swimming crab in the phalestry, and this is one that um, a lot of people overlook again, it's just got a small little crab, brownish sort of colour, and this is the, uh, the arch-fronted swimming crab. Lyocarcinus navigator, it's got a great scientific name. Now you can identify one of these by looking at it up close, it has a very straight um, front of the carapace between the eyes. No spines there at all, just a flat edge or arch front, if you like, slightly arched. And uh, again, yeah, quite an aggressive little crab, very zippy. And the oystermen find lots of these when they're fishing for oysters on the Fowler Street in the sail. A more rare, rarely recorded species, doesn't seem to be very abundant in Cornwall, but occasionally is found in the pots by the fishermen on the south coast. It's called the corrugated crab. It's like a velvet crab, but its, its shell has got these lovely little uh, cor corrugations. It, it feels almost like uh, corduroy. If any of you guys are old enough to remember corduroy trousers, um, I used to have a pair when I was very young. And um, well, that's, you know, that's a bit like uh, one of these crabs. Okay, so another rare species that occasionally is brought in by fishermen is the sponge crab. Now, this one is gets its name not because of its sh its shell is actually hard, but it carries around a spongy um, defense mechanism. It, it basically picks up a piece of living sponge, and it will trim it into shape and then carry it around using a pair of specially modified back legs with tiny little pin-like pinchers. 
and uh, a whole book like finches. A really beautiful species, lovely pinkish tips and this furry coating all over its body. And uh, lots more records of sponge crabs in the last few years. So again, I think it's possibly uh, an indication of uh, climate change and warming seas. Now a very rare species, uh, rarely recorded anyway, is a nut crab. I found this lovely photo on the Marlin website, so I hope I've got permission for Paula to show it. Uh, I think Paula's in the audience. Um, so this is a, a lovely little species, only um, a couple of centimetres. There are many different types of nut crab, so keep your eyes peeled if you ever find a crab with this unusual shaped carapace. It's probably a nut crab. And my absolute favourite all time um, crab species in the UK is this one, Goniplax rhomboides, the box crab, also known as the mud runner, runner crab. They live in quite deep areas and they like to bury in mud. So in the balustry we find these. Off Lundy divers come across burrows with these in as well. I wouldn't mind betting that night diving is probably the best way to find one because um, most crabs are more active at night. Personally, I've never seen one, which I hate to admit, I'd love to. Um, but I, I've seen them, um, I've seen a specimen, one was brought into the aquarium, so, but I haven't seen one in the wild. Lovely creatures, they really remind me of the tropical uh, ghost crabs that, that I've had so much fun trying to catch when, whenever I'm out in a hot country, I'm always looking for, looking for ghost crabs. Now this is, a, this is a fascinating one, this is the largest species of crab in the UK, the box crab, Paramola cuberi. Now they're found deep out on the abyssal plains out in the Atlantic, but occasionally fishermen will, will find them closer to shore. This specimen was caught in Falmouth Bay in a tangle net and brought into the aquarium where it lived for, for several years. Um, at the top of the animal, you can see this weird leg just sticking out. Um, this is its, its rear pair of legs. This one had lost one of its legs. Crabs can regrow their limbs, as you probably know, but uh, this one never got round to it. I think it was quite an old crab, but why does that leg stick up like that? Well, we couldn't find any uh, scientific um, studies on this species to answer that question. But a few um, a few months ago, we uh, we came across this amazing picture that was um, that was actually uh, on the BBC website of a, of a deep water paramola carrying a little lump of sea fan on its shell. So perhaps they're doing it for camouflage, a bit like the sponge crab that you saw earlier. And uh, this one's right next to the carcass of a rotting whale on the seabed. But fascinating, the biggest crabs in the UK grow to over a metre arm span and uh, quite striking. And um, occasionally we get this strange warm water visitor. This is the Columbus crab often found in amongst goose barnacles on drifting uh, driftwood that comes washing in from some more tropical climes. So keep a lookout in amongst the goose barnacles. If you ever come across a mass of them on the shore, you may well find one of these uh, warm water species. So we're moving to a different family of uh, crabs now, the spider crabs. And uh, a large crab, the most common of the spider crabs in UK waters, very familiar with our divers, is the spiny spider crab. When they're young, they're quite self-conscious and tend to cover themselves in seaweed. And this is what the uh, Newquay fishermen would call a commando crab. But as they get older, they, they get a bit less self-conscious. And um, one of the incredible sights that I've never witnessed personally, but I'd love to see is a spawning aggregation of spider crabs. They all get together to molt and spawn. And um, fantastic photo here by Dave Peake that I borrowed, thank you. But um, another person who's filmed this is um, Paul Naylor. So have a look on his website um, and you'll see some great video of, of uh, a spawning aggregation. Here's a male with much larger claws, very aggressive sometimes. They'll sometimes run right up towards you. This is a photo from Charles Hood, uh, fantastic photo. In the Cornwall, we very rarely find this species. This is the sea toad. It's a, a spider crab-like species, but you notice it's got the wrong number of legs. So it's actually from a different family of, of crabs. Uh, it prefers cold water. Have had a couple of sightings though. Very, very rarely seen them. What we do find a lot of is these small spider crabs that are spindly and there's several species. These are the Macropodia family. You can see these often decorate themselves with seaweed. Um, this is a very tiny one we found on the shore down at Lee. We also have the scorpion spider crabs. 
and these tend to decorate themselves with sponges and uh, they can be really beautiful. But again, several species, they're hard to separate to species level without taking it, you know, actually taking one home and removing all of its decoration, which is a bit cruel. Um, there's another one there covered in sponge. And this one's fascinating because this one, I can actually tell what species it is because this is the species that hides in amongst the stinging tentacles of a snake box cinnamon. Uh, this is the Nietzsche's spider crab, really beautiful. It's our equivalent of Nemo. On the shore, we sometimes come across this one. This is a really bizarre looking crab, brilliant decorators. It's called Gibbs spider crab. It's found several specimens down at um, Pole Depth, but you really have to have your eye in and really search in amongst the seaweeds to find one of these. Now, the next group we're going to talk about are the Enormoran crabs. Now, all of these only have four pairs of visible limbs. So the fifth pair is small and tucked away. And this group includes the hermit crabs, the squat wobblers, and the porcelain crabs. Now, um, yeah, and the stone crabs. So um, all of you have heard of the hermit crab, and this is a fantastic photo of a hermit crab in a glass shell that was loaned to the Wildlife Trust by Stella Turk. Um, this is a beautiful photo. You can see the little worm that shares the shell with the crab and uh, comes out and steals his lunch, much to the crab's annoyance. No one really knows if it has any other positive uses, but um, yeah, we, we, uh, we find, yeah, it's a fascinating thing to be able to watch if you can set that up in an aquarium. Uh, so there we have um, hermit crabs. In the rock pools, the same species stays small, which is interesting. They get much bigger further offshore. This is the left-handed hermit crab, the south clawed hermit crab, quite common in sandy areas. And this is the, the, uh, the hermit crab Pacuris pride, uh, pride which has a anemone around its shell, around its tail instead of a shell. Imagine that, it's much lighter than carrying a big shell. They have a, they use a small top shell uh, to begin with, and then eventually the anemone sort of takes over. It means they don't have to keep hunting for a new shell. When they get, um, when they get agitated, you'll end up with um, lots of these sort of Funny tentacles come out, these silly, it looks like silly strings, and that's a, a defense mechanism. Right, we're getting low on time, I'm afraid, everybody. So forgive me if I rush a little bit. Um, what I'm going to actually be doing, everyone, is I'm going to, um, if we do get cut off at 40 minutes, which is likely to happen, we're going to start up a new meeting. I'll be emailing everyone who, who came to this meeting a new link that they can then follow and we'll start up another meeting and finish this off and have some questions and answers. So anyway, hopefully I'll get through the, uh, the next couple of slides before we get cut off. Now, when I first saw one of these, it was absolutely amazing. This is again, um, this is the helper actually. It's called the hairy hermit crab. It looks like a, it's not a great photo, sorry, but it looks like a missile and rang it bang. And there's one hiding away. This is out on the mole beds, just off St. Maud. But the most famous, Hermit crab in our waters is the St. Hiram's crab. First discovered after a 40 year absence in uh, 2016 at Castle Beach during one of our shore search surveys. And we're very proud that it's been named the St. Hiram's crab after the patron saint of Cornwall following a, a vote on the BBC Spring Wash program. Uh, keep a lookout for these when you're rock pooling. They are quite shy, they like to hide away in their shells. You can easily identify them because they have two equal size claws, um, reddish antennae, and long eye stalks with black eyes and white spots. So just very quickly then, the porcelain crabs, you lift the stone and you see loads of these on all of our south coast beaches. This is the, the long pulled porcelain crab, and this is the broad pulled porcelain crab, bit of a mouthful, we call them BCDTs, makes it a bit easier. They're lovely little creatures, very delicate and uh, brilliant at living, hiding under the rocks. And uh, the squat lobsters. So again, you can see that they've got the wrong number of legs. These they have less legs than they should for a decapod, but the, they have two pairs that are hidden away underneath. And squat lobsters aren't really actually related to ordinary lobsters. They are the normal crabs, the same as the hermit crabs. When we first found one of these brightly coloured ones, we were absolutely blown away and thought we had a new species on our hands. This is a juvenile of the blue striped squat lobster, like I just showed you. Quite, um, quite interesting, again, how juveniles can often be much more colourful. And then we have the 
the standard squat lobster, Galatea squamifera. Um, as you can see, this juvenile has a, a white stripe, but the adult is a solid brown colour. Now, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had this sent in to us um, by one of the supporters of the Cornwall Good Seafood Guide, and this is a really bizarre find. Another deep water species. You can see the wrong number of limbs, so it only has three legs visible. Uh, so this is also an anormal crab, but this is a deep sea species called the stone crab, very rarely found in Cornish waters, um, normally found further north or out off the edge of the continental shelf, but yeah, very, very spiny. And they have this weird lightweight uh, carapace, it's not very well calcified. Um, it appears to sort of be lightweight for flexibility and they rely on spines for protection instead of um, shell. So I just very wrapping this up then into the lobsters. All of you will be familiar, I'm sure, with this one. This is the European lobster, Homerus gamerus. And um, this one is the London stream, also known as scampi. Now we don't really get many of these in diveable depths in Cornwall, but out on muddy areas a bit further offshore, you do sometimes find these living in burrows. And then finally, the crawfish, making its comeback at the moment. Also known as the spiny lobster, the crawfish was virtually uh, wiped out back in the 1960s and 70s by fishing and uh, divers picking them up. And we're really pleased to report that now we're seeing them on lots of, lots of dive sites all around Cornwall. And this little chap is even rarer. Keep a look out, it's only about three inches long. This is the slipper lobster. So there you go. We've got, um, haven't really got time to go through the non native ones. I'm going to probably add them into my. Uh, my discussion meeting, which will happen uh, once this one ends. So look out for an email, everybody, and then you'll get an invite and we'll, we'll reconvene in just a couple of minutes time and uh, answer some of your questions. So thank you very much for listening.